Good morning. Good morning. Any widow people in the house? Widow people? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, if you do not know who I am, for those of you that are new here, and I'm sorry for that if you're new here, <laughs> I'm sorry that you have to be here. Uh, let me introduce myself really quick. My name is Kelly Lynn, and I was widowed at age 39, five years ago, very suddenly, when my husband Don left one morning for work and never came home. Um, he had a massive heart attack at age 46, and the life that I knew disappeared. The worst part for me was coming home at night, every night, and being in that apartment, in that dark space, literally and figuratively, and being totally alone, and knowing that that was my life now. That was the worst part. I tried to find support, but there was nothing. I couldn't find anything. Or I could find something, but everybody was like 95 years old <laughs> that this had happened to. Nobody was my age. Couldn't find a thing. So about three months after my loss, I drove from New Jersey to Long Island, which is about a two-hour drive, because I was that desperate to find somebody, anybody, to talk to about what this is. And I had found this group called Young Widows. That's what it was called, Young Widows. So I was like, okay, young. No, no, okay. So I was 39. So I drove out there, it was like two and a half hours in traffic. Um, I get there, I walk in, and the first woman I meet is, I'm guessing 107. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, oh dear, in her terrible, horrible, awful Long Island accent, which was completely unsupportive as well. <laughs> she says, dear, how long has it been for you? <laughs> and I said, three months. And she looks at me again and she says, oh honey, it's gonna get so much worse. <laughs> And I'm thinking, this is a support group? <laughs> so, I walked out of there that night, I ran out of there that night, I sat in my car in the parking lot, and I sobbed. I sobbed for like 20 minutes. Just started crying. Because my only thought was, is that my future? Is, are those people my future? Is that what I'm looking at for my life now? That? Because I can't do that. I can't do this if that's my future. And I made a vow to myself. After I cried for 20 minutes straight, I made a vow to myself. And I said, that's not going to be my future. I am not going to be that. There has to be something better. There has to be. So from that day forward, I just kept writing. I kept hanging out with friends. I kept doing what made me feel better anything to make me feel better for a minute. And I kept furiously looking for better support. And then one day I got an email from a woman named Michelle. One <laughs> She said that she had come across my personal blog, RIPTheLifeIKnew.com, and also my YouTube page where I had posted a video of myself doing comedy about my dead husband because I'm a comedian. So, um, she asked if she could call me, said okay, and as soon as I heard her voice on the phone, I knew, just knew, this was somebody special. She explained who she was, and then she asked me if I'd be interested in doing a comedy presentation about grief and loss and about what had happened to me at a conference for widowed people. <laughs> and I said, that's a thing? <laughs> like, I can go to a place and I can talk about this bizarre life that I have now and I can make jokes about it? That's a thing? And she said, yeah, that's a thing. It's called Camp Widow. And I was like, well, hell yeah, I want to do that. That sounds amazing. And then I paused because I thought about what she just said, and I was like, what the fuck is Camp Widow? <laughs> so this afternoon at 4.15, I will be giving my 11th 
Evans presentation at Camp Widow. At this weird thing called Camp Widow. This is the 11th time. I can't believe it. And every time I do it, it's an honor. It's an absolute honor. I'm thankful every single day that Michelle with one L found me. And I'll say it again and again until the end of time that meeting her and being a part of this, this community, is what saved me. It saved my life, and I'm, that is no exaggeration. Not only did it save my life, it gave me a life. It made me want to have a life again when I didn't want one. I didn't want one. A lot of you don't want one right now. I didn't want one either. Um, those of you that know me have probably heard me say about Michelle that she took her pain, her loss, and her grief, and with it, she grew a family. I could barely get out of bed. I could barely shower. This woman took what we're all dealing with and created this. That's astounding. She built a family. That is what this woman did. That is who this woman is. Those of you who know, also know me probably also know that since I've met Michelle, I've had the creepiest girl crush on her. <laughs> when I say creepy, I mean creepy. <laughs> After I lost my husband, Don, for the longest time, like, when I say long, I mean three, four years, I couldn't even think about someone else. Like, the idea of someone else made me nauseous. Like, it literally made me physically sick to my stomach if a guy even looked at me. But the first crush I had was on a woman. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? What's happening? Am I gay now? <laughs> Did being a widow make me gay? good. She's one of those people I just care what she thinks. I want her to be proud of me. <laughs> and, you know, everything I do, I'm like, you know, did, did Michelle see that? Did, did you know she said, saw what I did? Did she, did she see my presentation? Do you guys know? I'm, I'm so annoying. I'm like, what, what, what did Michelle say? Did she say anything about me? She said, what did she say? Do you know what she said? <laughs> <laughs> it's really sad <laughs> how obsessed I am with this woman. Um, she didn't even technically ask me to do this today. <laughs> like, if I'm being honest, <laughs> I kind of begged. <laughs> she was in New York about a week and a half ago, and I somehow finagled my way into having dinner with her. and. At dinner, I was like, so, how does the keynote thing work? Like, the person who introduces you, like, do you ask them, or do they ask you, or how does that happen? Because, you know, I'm interested. <laughs> and <laughs> she paused for a minute, and then she said, well, it's funny you should say that, because I was actually going to ask you to do it in Toronto. <laughs> in my head, I was like, no, you fucking weren't. <laughs> And so she's like, oh shit, now I'm going to ask her to do it. And so that was her graceful way of doing that because that's who she is, right? So she probably went home to her husband Michael that night and was like, oh my god, that lunatic Kelly is introducing me at camp. She asked me, I didn't know how to get out of it. I don't know how to get rid of this girl. She just keeps coming back. <laughs> So she asked me to try to keep this to about 10 minutes, and I'm really trying, but I gotta tell you, it's not easy to condense everything that this woman means to me and everything that she is 
in 10 minutes. It's literally not possible. It would take me a lifetime to thank her for waking me up to life again. And the only way I can really think to do that, to thank her for that, is to continue to be there for all the people that come after me that are in that same dark place that I was sitting in five years ago. And to let them know that there is a better future for you. There is a future for you that doesn't completely suck. And that they're not alone. Um, so I'd like to end this by reading a little piece that I wrote about her that I think encapsulates what it is I really want to say about this incredible woman. And it's called She. She who stood in the ruins and built hope. She who looked at death and made life. She who took her pain and reached out, providing cushions and nets and places to fall and land for the rest of us that hurt. She who was brave, bright, and beaming. She who took the end and with it created a beginning. She who refused to accept or believe that love ever ends because it doesn't, it won't, it can't. She who tells us this and makes us believe it too until we really, truly do. She who picks us up, gives us tools, sits with us inside of wherever we are. She who doesn't run from death or from life. She who took ashes and made paper airplanes that fly. She who stood on cement blocks made from tears and loss. She who inspires from the wreckage. She who removed all shame from the word widow. She who radiates joy, love, and hope. She who is changing how we feel, think, and live. In big ways and small ways, in all ways. She who leaves a mark on every soul that she touches. She who I call friend, mentor, hero. Beautiful, wise, funny, delightful, lovely, wonderful friend. She who is named Michelle. Just one out. <laughs> she will reshape the world. I have no doubt that I speak for everybody in this room when I say a million times and forever until the end of time, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And to quote my husband on the night we got married in our hotel room when he said to me, thank you for giving me a family. So ladies and gentlemen, my family, please, please stand for our mama widow bear, <laughs> our beautiful beacon of light and hope, the lovely, the beautiful, the incomparable, <laughs> the person I'm stopping. <laughs> please lift the restraining order, Michelle.
what would, how would you define hope? Maybe that, that's fine. How would you define hope? So I asked Webster, and Webster did not have anything useful to say. You, this is some expected potential, maybe, might happen thing. Well, no wonder nobody talks about hope in a keynote address, and then we're supposed to define it. And so, the more I thought about it over the last couple of weeks, the more I thought, you know, what is it about hope that draws people? What is it about hope? And, and when I started looking up some hope quotes, there's some awful ones, by the way. I know you might not think so, but if you look up hope for a living, you find a lot of things. It's like, hope is the most terrible thing ever. I'm like, uh-oh, not that one. <laughs> um, but I started thinking about, okay, so, you know, what is it about hope that matters to people? Why does hope matter? And so I started trying to define it myself. And the first thing that came to me was that hope is buoyant. And when I started thinking about buoyancy, the mo you know, I was thinking, like, what, a, what is it about hope that lifts people? And I think it's interesting, too, when you look at some of the most powerful hope quotes, they're written by people like Anne Frank, right? They're written by people like Helen Keller. They're written by people who have been really, really in dark, places facing very, very difficult challenges. And when I thought about the buoyancy of hope, I started thinking about Willy Wonka. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the part in Willy Wonka where they sip the fizzy lifting drink? Yes. And who sips the fizzy lifting drink? First, Grandpa. Or, well, Will Grandpa gets it second. But Grandpa starts lifting. For the first time, Grandpa's been bedridden. What got Grandpa out of bed was the golden ticket that Charlie was going to share with Grandpa. So Grandpa has feeling like he's seen the best days of his life. And then Charlie gets a golden ticket to go to see Willy Wonka's amazing place. And what happens to Grandpa? He starts to sip in some juice. <laughs> and before he knows it, he's floating to the ceiling. And that's the thing about buoyancy of hope, right? That no matter where you are, no matter how dark the place, what hope does is it slowly, slowly, slowly starts to lift you. And here's the cool thing. You don't have to know what you hope for. Think about that for a second. You don't have to know what you're hoping for. Now, of course, there's times when you're going to hope for something very specific, right? And I'm going to guess that many of you in this room have hoped for something very specific that did not happen. I can tell you that when I stood at the end of my husband's emergency room bed, I hoped that he wasn't going to die. And that hope was not met with a successful outcome reaching the, the big thing that I was hoping for. That very specific instance. So what did you think? after having the experience of hoping that hope would all be squashed? Like, I mean, I feel like somebody stomped all over that hope. Stomped all over it. So why is it then that the next day you still have this sense of like, hmm, is there anything? And so you'll hear people say things like, situations are hopeless. Right? And I guess, in that moment, it was a hopeless situation. He was certainly not going to be alive. That much was true. But despite the fact that he wasn't going to be alive, there still could exist a little bubble of hope for I don't know what. For I don't know what. My life was going to be okay somehow? Somehow this horrible darkness wasn't going to be all there was. I didn't have a definition for what I could possibly hope for. And the cool thing is, you don't have to. For hope to be buoyant, it doesn't have to be definable. It can still lift you up, despite the fact that you might not know exactly what you're hoping for. Maybe you're thinking I'm crazy right now. But here's the other piece of it. I think we go through the widowed experience, right? 
And in the early days, you have not a clue what you can hope for, right? And maybe in the middle days, you're starting to hope that maybe life isn't going to be this, this, or this. And maybe later, you think, but maybe life will be this, this, and this. And then maybe further down the road, you get to a place where you feel like, you know what, my life is actually kind of great. Do you need hope still there? Yes, you do. For what? I don't know. I don't know what you may need hope for, but what I do know is that hope lifts people all the time. Out of darkness, out of impossibility, out of grief, out of pain, it lifts people. Even when they don't want to be lifted. So you take a little sip of the fizzy lifting drink and start going, eh, eh, eh. no, 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 put me down. I don't want to be lifted by hope, thank you very much. And yet, there's this impossible feeling of like, wait, my feet are lifting. And might you crash down? Sure. Will you crash down? Probably. But does that mean you won't be lifted again? That's the thing about hope. So the second idea that came to me was, it's irrepressible. Even when you don't want it, even when you kick it away, even when you walk yourself in a dark room, even if you thought, I'm going to go down to the bottom of the pit and I'm going to stay here and none of you are getting in here, no one's coming in, nothing's coming, no light, no nothing. So, when I was thinking about the irrepressibility of hope, I thought, you know how sometimes people will have a puppy or a kitten and they take one of those LED lights and it's a little red light, right? And then I, you know you've seen video of this, you know, and they're like, oh, light over there, dog goes running. Light over there, dog goes running. And so you take this little red light and it's just all over, and the poor dog's like, where is that light coming from? That dog. Where is that light coming from? What is that doing in here? I said no hope allowed. And then suddenly there's a little light under the door. And you're like, oh my god, there it is again. And then you try to stamp it out and it turns over there. And you run over there and think, no, I said no hope. I said no hope. There's no hope in this situation. And yet that light keeps popping up even though you thought you stopped it quite right out. And here's the other amazing thing about it. It's not just hope for you. It's hope for each other. It's hope for humanity. Hope is not, it's a team sport. It's not solo. We don't hope solo, really. We don't. If we did, we'd be able to stamp it out, right? If it was 100% up to me, in those early days, if hope mattered at that point, certainly didn't matter to me. I didn't understand it. I didn't want it. And yet, there was this little lifting that happened when someone hugged me and said, I care about you. When someone said, I'm going to take out the trash for you. When someone said, don't worry about the kids, I'm going to take them to school for you. Like any small kindness equaled that little red light on the ground and me following it with my eyes because I couldn't quite believe that there was a little red light. And so here I am, chasing the little red light around, chasing the little red light around. Think about the lottery. Is there anything more hopeful than the lottery? Except for I heard you have to buy a ticket. So all this time you're hoping I'm going to win the lottery, but I keep forgetting to buy the ticket. So the thing is that that's, it's that. If, if I try this, maybe this outcome is going to be different. Okay? But what's that mean for widowed people? What does that mean for you? Because there's a part of our outcome that cannot be different. And here's the challenge of hope for widowed people. It's this, that despite the fact that you can't define it, despite the fact that you may not want it, despite the fact that maybe you've been living this life 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, being widowed and thinking to yourself, this part hasn't changed yet. You still have the opportunity for life to be something positive and beautiful that you cannot yet define. That you cannot yet define. Now, let's think about that from the point of view of, let's say you've been widowed 20 years and you can't yet define what hope means 
in your 20 year space. Why? Because life evolves. Why are you going to need hope? Didn't you know you were all going to get fixed at some point? If you're going to be fixed, then what would we need hope for later? Of course we're not going to be fixed. In the way that many times people ask, are you, oh, you're feeling better today? Or, oh, I'm so glad you have a new person in your life. That means that you're not going to be grieving anymore. Because they want very much for this experience to be over. And yet it's a part of the fabric of who we are. But here's the beautiful thing about that. Hope is part of the fabric of who you are. Even when you don't want it. Sometimes especially when you don't want it. Especially when you think that hope's not for me. Awesome for you, not for me. Great for you, not for me. And when you travel in the company of other widowed people, you're certain to see other people taking different paths, right? You're certain to see like, well, that person happened this, this, this way, but my life is not looking like that. You're certain to find yourself at some point comparing your life and your widow journey to someone else's. I promise, you will. Because you're gonna meet somebody else and be like, huh, wow. And sometimes that'll be good, and sometimes that'll be like, whoop, not me. But no matter how you look at it, you are looking at someone else's life and thinking, huh, well that worked out for you. But it's not for mine. And my friends, that is where hope in its little red light comes out for you. Because no matter where you are, no matter what happens, guess what? You have an opportunity for that little red light to slide into your door, even after you've closed it and stuck towels by there. Because that light is not getting in here. And sometimes we trick ourselves, right, into thinking like, okay, well, I'm here now, wherever that is. Sometimes that's, okay, I made it through the first six months. Sometimes I made it through the year. Sometimes I made it through five years. And we say to ourselves, okay, we'll see. I don't need that hope light anymore. And then you find yourself struggling with what? Maybe it's an illness. Maybe you yourself are sick right now. And you'd like very much for someone your person, not someone, a specific person to be here taking care of you or walking through a challenge with you. Maybe you have a child and your child is struggling and you've been widowed some time, but now your little person is struggling and you wish that their other parent could be with them. Maybe you're looking at someone else's life and you didn't have a chance to have kids and you wanted that bad. And you're looking at someone else's life saying, again, not for me. But here's the thing, hope says, hope is that little thing with feathers that sings the song over and over and over again without stopping at all. Emily Dickinson, never stopping at all. No matter how long you've been with it, no matter what the thing is you might be hoping for, no matter how many times you've been disappointed in reaching for a thing, whatever it is, that undefined, Thing. Hope keeps singing. Hope keeps lifting. Hope keeps tempting you with that little red light, saying, come over here, come over here, come over here. Try this on the side. Hope is for you. Every one of you. Every one of us. Everyone in the world. Hope is for us. But as I said, it's a team sport. Hope is a team sport. So, it's contagious, like chicken pox. <laughs> <laughs> but think about chicken pox. You meet somebody who has chicken pox, they don't have any spots yet, you don't know they have chicken pox. Next thing you know, you have chicken pox. Or, they have chicken pox and you think, oh God, I drank out of your drink yesterday. I have chicken pox. You don't know that someone's passed you hope. You don't know. And guess what else you don't know? You don't know when you pass someone else hope. So you're out there all spreading disease. <laughs> <laughs> One at a time, at a time, at a time. You are hope. You receive hope. 
through every phase of your life, not just your widowed life, of course, your whole life. We all do. And this contagion of hope is what makes it irrepressible. You can't stamp it out. There's no vaccine. You can't get away from it. Why? Because here's the thing. You see me standing up here? Someone told you or you've heard me say this, you've heard me say it or someone else said to you, yeah, you know, her husband was hit and killed by a car. And then you think, I understand what it's like for my person to be dead. She's still standing up. Wow, I guess after 11 years, she still has not given up hope. What does that mean for you? It means hope is for you. Hope is for you. And you don't have to take any responsibility for it. How oh, great! You don't even have to know what you hope for. And I think sometimes that's the catch, right? It's like, well, what do I hope? I mean, what do I hope for? Or, I've hoped and I've been disappointed. So thank you very much. I don't want your hope. Take it back. But guess what? A little red light under the door and try as you might to step it out, it gets on top of your shoe instead of being stomped, right? That red light gets on everything. And that is why hope is so powerful. Because there's no way to stamp it out, despite all circumstances. So if we think about Anne Frank for a minute, being locked down in a room thinking she's never coming out and the Nazis are up above killing her family and everyone she knows and the world she knows. And yet, what does she hold on to? Hope. Why? Because it's lifting her out of the darkness. And even if it's only a tiny bit of fizzy drink, just a little bit of lift, it brings you up. Hope elevates you. Hope elevates the people around you. And this little girl in a dark basement has elevated thousands and millions and millions of people since she lived through that trauma. And so when we think about our role in the world, when we think about what we have to give, guess what? Every single one of us has the ability to give hope. And it's not even hard. All you got to do is keep standing up. And when you feel like you don't have any, ask the person next to you, surely they have some chicken pox to give. <laughs> All you have to do to find hope is look to one more person, one more person, one more person. Especially when we have the gift of having a community of widowed people. Because that's what we are for each other. Right? You're going to watch people here this weekend. I know that some of you, this is your first day here, and you're probably thinking, holy smokes, what's going on? Because you haven't yet had an opportunity to interact with this many people. But when what brings us together is something that usually makes people gasp, you what? Oh, they died how? Oh, oh you're widowed? No way, you're too young. What? No, that didn't happen. You're not going to hear that here. Why? Because we all lived through some varied story of that. But what you will hear here is everyday stories of getting back up. Everyday stories. And every single one of you has one. And truly one of the biggest honors of my life has been to hear them. Because time after time after time, you're stepping into situations where you think, oh yeah, I never was going to do that, but here I am. A couple of you drove here from your various hometowns for the first time by yourself, got in that car and said, I'm going to do it. Rock stars. Several of you have said, you know, my career is not fit. It doesn't fit anymore. I've got to figure this out. Who am I? And you're figuring it out. Rock stars. Many of you thought to yourselves, how the hell am I going to get out of this hotel room and go down there with all those people again? They don't know if I can do it. 
rock stars. So many of you are in transitions in your life where you're saying to yourself, I don't know where I'm going. Where am I going? And yet, what are you doing? Stepping courageously into the unknown. Rock stars. Many of you are in new relationships and having to say to yourself, if I love you, I'm taking the risk that I have to do this whole thing all over again. And you're stepping courageously, day after day, making the choice. Why? Because love will change your life over and over and over again. And you know it. Why? Because your life's been changed by love already. And here you step courageously into the unknown. Rock stars. And I don't know how many times you hear that in your everyday life. You don't know how many times people say, oh, you know, I'm proud of you, or you're doing an amazing job. But here I am to tell you today, I'm proud of you. Kelly Lynn, I'm so proud of you.